Thank you. We mostly think of fishes in one of two contexts, either as a source of food or a source of recreation. My own fishing career was brief when it came time to impale worms on hooks and to t twist them out of fish's mouths. I lost interest. I just couldn't help seeing it from their perspective. At that time, my family and I would make occasional trips to McDonald's, and I made it no association with those fishes on my hook, on my line, with the anonymous ones who ended up in the filet fish sandwiches I used to have. At that time, McDonald's was boasting one billion served. They were speaking of customers, but they could have been speaking about chickens or fishes. I also remember dolphin safe tuna campaigns. I'm wondering why there were no tuna safe tuna campaigns. The fact is, we've been alienated from fishes. We can look out over water, and there may be thousands just below the surface, but we cannot see any of them. It's only in the last 50 years where we've had scuba technology and underwater cinematography that allow us to see them in their own environment. Those unblinking eyes, consider those unblinking eyes, permanently bathed in water and therefore in no need of eyelids. And the sounds they make, fishes actually make lots of sounds, but we can't hear them because again, they're below the surface. It's very hard to be an active listener when you can't hear anything. Today, I want to invite you to see fishes through a different lens. I've spent the last five years swimming among, researching and writing about fishes, culminating in this book, What a Fish Knows, which I'm happy to say is soon available in a German translation. Not sure about Russian yet. <laughs> so let me start with a few superlatives about fishes. The longest fish name belongs to the Hawaiian reef triggerfish, known to the locals as the Humu Humu Nuku Nuku Apua'a, <laughs> which stands for the fish who sews with a needle and grunts like a pig. <laughs> for me, the prettiest fish name belongs to the diagonal banded sweet lips. I don't know about you, when I see those lips, I just want to give them a kiss. <laughs> Perhaps the smallest vertebrate on earth is this little fish of Philippine lakes. You could put 300 adults on one side of a scale and a penny on the other, and the penny will go down. The new record holder for longevity among vertebrates goes to the Greenland shark. When scientists analyze the corneal layers laid down each year on the eye, just like the rings of a tree, one of the females in the study had 392 layers. She was approaching her 400th birthday when uh, she was caught apparently healthy by fishermen. My nomination for the kinkiest mating system goes to the deep sea angler fishes. There's about 160 known species. These animals, it's very hard to find the right mate if you're a male living in the darkest, biggest habitat on earth. So you want to make good if you do find the right female. And how do males make good? They bite her, and it's the last bite they ever take. The way it works is scientists often call it um, parasitic sexuality and a parasitic mating system. And in the sense that um, the male is um, attached as a parasite, we can see that, and she provides all the food, she does all the nourishment. We can see how it is um, sort of parasitic. But when you consider that a female's life history is nothing, it, doesn't come, it comes to an end if there's no male, then it's not fully parasitic. So for, but for any radical feminist in the audience, you may take some grim pleasure in the knowledge that some males never do amount to anything more than an appendage. But let's go beyond superlatives and think about fish minds and fish feelings, what fishes are capable of. 
Consider this little five inch long fish, the frill finned goby, lives in intertidal zones. This is their habitat. And we've wondered for a while why they can jump accurately from one tide pool to another and work their way out to the ocean. They can do that. How do they do that? A series of experiments was done that showed that they actually memorize the tide pool zone by swimming down among it at high tide. So when the water's in, they can swim down among the rocks and remember where things are. It's very useful if an octopus or a heron comes along and trying, trying to catch you. And it saves having to make a leap of faith and end up stranded on the rocks. What about tool use and observational learning in fishes? Can they do that? Yes, archer fishes use water as a tool by squirting it at insects who may be perched or flying by over the water. And they don't, this doesn't just come innate, they have to learn it from other fishes. They can learn this by watching other individuals practice their skill. They also are flexible in how they do this. If the insect is flying close to the water, they squirt directly at the, at the insect, so they, and they rotate their body at the same time. If, however, the insect is further away, they, they squirt ahead of the insect, like passing a, a football, or in America, a football. Because archer fishes squirt water, they're really good subjects for studies to test preferences or test ability to recognize things. For a long time, people who keep fishes in aquariums have said that the fish recognize me, recognizes me, they know it's me. And now we have the science to back that up. You can train archer fishes with familiar faces and then present them with one familiar face among 30 or more, 40 or more even, unfamiliar faces, and they will squirt water at the one familiar face in the crowd. Fishes also have the face inversion effect. A face that's familiar to them the right way up, if you turn it upside down, they can't recognize it. We also have the face inversion effect. Chimpanzees do not, and if you consider their behavior, you can see why. Fishes actually, referential communication is rare in nature, and it's vanishingly rare across species. And yet we have an example here of, among fishes who can do this. The fish on top is a grouper, and the one on the bottom is a moray eel. Groupers invite moray eels to hunt cooperatively with them by a gesture. They make a head shake or a full body shimmy. And the grouper knows what it means. It means, will you come hunting with me? And if the grouper is hungry and in the mood, off they swim over the reef together. And their hunting styles are complementary. The moray eel is like a little ferret and can go into the nooks and crannies. So if a fish flees into the reef, the moray eel can go after. And if the moray eel is unable to catch the fish because the fish swims into open water, you know who's waiting, the grouper. Sometimes groupers will point to a prey for 20 minutes or more to try to get the moray eel to come over to, to catch this. And in fact, stu observational studies show that they, by working together, they can be as much as five times more successful at catching fish than if they work alone. English science writer Ed Young sums it up with a familiar jingle. If your prey's in a hole and you don't have a pole, fetch your more. Captive studies find that groupers recognize a cooperative moray eel versus an uncooperative one, and they will choose the cooperative one the next day. You may notice this is a laminated eel, not a real one. It allows scientists who use police to control the eels and make some of them cooperative and some of them uncooperative. Can we find Machiavell Machiavellian intelligence in fishes? Yes, we can. On reefs, one of the most sophisticated mutualisms in nature happens on reefs. It's the cleaner client mutualism. It's very well studied. There are probably more than 150 published studies on this relationship. And it works by having uh, cleaners, these two cleaners here you can see, and they 
offer a cleaning service to client fishes of more than a hundred different kinds who will line up to wait their turn to be serviced by the cleaners. The cleaners pluck parasites off the, off the uh, clients, so they get food, and the clients get a parasite removal service and a spa treatment. And you can see the client is cooperative, opening the mouth and opening the gills, gill covers. And nobody has ever seen a client fish eat the cleaner fish, even though they easily could do that. It just doesn't sustain good basic, good business relationships to eat your partner. Now for the Machiavellian part. Sometimes cleaners don't do such a good job. If there's... Cleaners can do what's called mucus nipping, where they bite a little moat of mucus off the skin of the client. And that makes the client jolt often. And that probably signals to other clients in the queue that maybe these cleaners aren't doing a very good job. What about stress relief? Oh, one other point I forgot to make. To curry favor with unhappy clients, cleaners will sometimes do what's called a caressing. They will stroke the client fish with their pectoral fins. Which leads me to a study of stress relief. Uh, st a study from the University of Lisbon, scientists collected s surgeon fishes, striated surgeon fishes, and then they stressed them even more. Being caught is stressful, but being put into a bucket of water for 30 minutes is very stressful. And you can measure stress in a fish by taking a little blood sample from the tail vein and seeing that the cortisol level, a stress hormone, goes up. And what they found was curious. If a stressed fish was put in a tank with a model of a cleaner fish, which you just met, the cleaner wrasse, in which case, in which the cleaner model was attached to a motor and it would sweep back and forth like that in a waving motion, the one on top, it has a different, different outcome than if it's put in a tank with a stationary cleaner fish. The model doesn't move. In the top one, the fishes would visit that moving cleaner fish an average of 15 times per hour. In the bottom one, they didn't visit it at all. The top one could give them strokes, they could get stress relief, and the stress levels, cortisol, came down. Not so in the bottom one. So we see evidence here for fishes being stressed, but also being able to seek out stress relief when given the opportunity. If fishes can be cooperative and Machiavellian, and if they can get stressed and they can get stress relief, maybe they can be virtuous too. Is it true? Here's one example. Rabbit fishes of various species, we see four here in each quadrant, they forage as a team, kind of like mores and groupers, except they don't catch other fish, they eat algae off the coral reef. And you can see that while one individual is down in the reef with the head down feeding on algae, the other of the pair is head up, playing lookout. This is virtuous because it's foregoing gratification. The one who's playing lookout is not getting any food. And if he or she sees danger, a moray and a grouper perhaps, they can signal that danger and the two fishes can swim off quickly to get safe. Of course, they switch places. After a few minutes, the one on the bottom comes up and the one goes down. So both of them get to be fed in a safer way. In our relations with fishes, we could be more virtuous than we have been. It's unknown how many fishes we kill every year, but estimates range anywhere from 200 billion to perhaps a trillion or more. And fish farming, aquaculture, also consumes billions of fishes. And it's a very stressful, difficult environment on a fish farm. The crowding, the concentrated number of fishes in one place, the uh, parasites that thrive in these environments, the chemicals used to try to get rid of the parasites, the concentrated wastes of the fishes, the frustration of natural behaviors, all of these things are very difficult for these fishes to cope with, and many of them just simply can't manage. The salmon on the bottom, the farmed salmon, is the same age as the one on top. And the industry term for the one on the bottom is a dropout. This individual 
simply couldn't cope with the stresses of captivity. He or she stopped eating, the stress levels go very high, the fish floats to the surface and dies. And the oceans and freshwater habitats around the world are beleaguered by a number of terrible problems facing them, growing problems. Climate change, warming oceans, you've heard of that. Ocean acidification, or acid levels are rising slowly, well, more quickly. Coral bleaching is a result of some of these problems. Plastic pollution, the manufacturer of plastics produces huge numbers of little plastic beads which are ingested by little fishes who feed on fish eggs. They look just like the plastic beads, they're very similar, leading their stomachs to rupture because they cannot digest them and of course that kills them. Speaking of plastics, we leave, discard or lose approximately 640,000 tons of fishing gear in the oceans every year. You may have heard of bycatch, of which about 200 million pounds a day of dead or dying sea creatures who we don't, the fishermen are not trying to catch, they're tossed back in the ocean. 98% of all the animals we take are to be eaten. And we've been eating a lot, such that we've lost about half of all marine life in the last half century. Are there any other ways we can eat? Of course, there are. We can uh, choose other things. And uh, probably the most immediate way we can help fishes is to uh, refrain from eating them. However, technological advances are leading to other choices. Companies like New Wave Foods and Finless Foods are developing plant-based and in vitro alternatives to fish as food. Many products are already available now. So in closing, science has shown us that fishes are intelligent, that they think, they feel, they have emotions, they can get stressed, they can feel stress relief, they can be upset, they can be annoyed. They have a lot of characteristics that make them very special creatures. And I think we would do better to treat them better. And I believe in karma, that a better world is for, for them, if we are more respectful and compassionate towards them, we will be more respectful and compassionate toward each other. That's the kind of world I'd like to live in. Thank you.